paper, and the the best one, which is quite a new one, uh, sounds like the closed version of objectify itself. <coughs> and I think it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> so this is how we play with the titles, and then also playing with the research design itself. Uh, do you mind if we turn the lights on? Okay, yes, <laughs> <laughs> It's really hard to think, you know, to present in, in the darkness. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone, and today we are presenting uh, myself with the team of my colleagues with whom we are conducted this uh, research. Um, I want to outline in the very beginning this, these are the preliminary uh, findings, and we are not finally done with the, uh, uh, with the I don't know, with the conceptualization which is kind of close here, but uh, we are trying to work on it, so uh, we would really appreciate <coughs> any comments on the methodology or on the way how we can analyze our data further on or on the any uh, of uh, philosophical assumptions you might uh, offer to us as, uh, as, you know, as our research is still ongoing. So the topic is the imposed burden of objectified self, and we're trying to conceptualize the process of the values replacement through the social act on the Instagram. Uh, and basically, how did this whole thing start? And we've been talking about the post true qualities as uh, the way how we understand our reality, and we're starting with this shift which occurs in the public arena when uh, a lot of information which is coming to us is losing its sense through the uh, through the shift of the focus, right? So we are focusing on the emotional aspect uh, and this is the most crucial for the uh, information comprehension. And when we've been talking about and thinking and rethinking the, uh, the whole idea of the post trip, we came to the, uh, the, to the fact rejection concept. So as uh, you're probably all familiar with the research, it's the Lewandowski and his team. Uh, on the uh, uh, on the on, on the attitude towards the Trump, um, as the, during the experiment, it was found out that uh, people uh, who are uh, who've been Trump supporters for a while, uh, after they are being exposed to some facts, and these facts would show the other side of the facts presented previously, they still stay on the side of the Trump. So. Uh, as we are going and moving on, this fact rejection kind of happens uh, in the minds of the people. So uh, as it appears to be one of the most essential characteristics of the uh, post truth politics, we uh, try to understand how social media logic and how social media environment might be influencing the whole process of this truth rejection. Uh, as we are kind of living in this information bubble, uh, I don't know, working with our social media accounts, creating our uh, separate realities within the mediated environment. And what we really want to see is how the echo chamber effect is uh, going to get and resonating with post truth politics in the social media. Uh, I, I suppose everyone's familiar with the echo chamber effect, and uh, we are here thinking about the way how selective exposure uh, is supported and the principles of uh, an individual being uh, active in terms of information seeking, but uh, the algorithms of social media, they help us to uh, kind of make it more powerful and uh, make it, uh, in a sense, um, I don't know, uh, more, I, I would say more powerful uh, in, a, in a way how we create the reality of uh, our media consumption. So, uh, the fact rejection, the echo chamber effect, and the whole discourse of posture politics lead us to the concept of posture logic of social media. So, on the one hand, we are having the algorithm, which is uh, kind of <coughs> set up by the user, but at the same time is influenced by the whole media agenda in general. Uh, and we have, on the other hand, the effects and the way how people tend to consume the information and uh, place their values and attribute their ideas to the certain aspects of their reality. Uh, here we want to uh, go back to this effective term coming and rooting back in the 60s and uh, 
uh, which, uh, which, which leads us to the era of post emotion So, as we've been discussing this quite, quite for a while, uh, and mo mo a lot of been discussing this concept yesterday, um, in the 60s, the, the role of uh, emotions was changing for the society in general. And what we have now is the return uh, to the, not to the roots, but to the new type of the emotion. Uh, so, with the many uh, different, uh, I don't know, uh, worldwide events which were quite traumatic for the people to experience, uh, the, the overall discourse of the, of the emotional uh, attachment of, of, of the emotional expression towards these events uh, was shifting. And people, will, you know, uh, putting their emotions down uh, and kind of trying to uh, move to the uh, the age of reasoning. Nowadays, we are having the opposite thing, as uh, the emotion uh, is becoming uh, quite preliminary and quite quite quite, quite essential uh, for the uh, understanding of the context of different situations as uh, we are having a lot of, we're having uh, the, emotion, uh, the, the information overload and the emotional component in the message uh, makes the message more clear for the comprehension and easier for the consumption. But this emotion at the same time is a post emotion, right? As it's navigated and it's uh, constituted by the algorithm. Uh, the whole thing led us to this concept of post-truth logic of social media, as we are uh, we are trying to conceptualize the way how algorithmic uh, mechanisms are recreating the post-truth, the emotional type of reasoning, instead of the reasoning based on fact. So, uh, moving on, we uh, posted the research question, and our <laughs> research question was quite obvious. As we created this term, uh, we want to understand what is the, uh, the post-trip uh, social media logic. Um, the, uh, based on the prior research on post-trip, we wanted to understand is it going to be political only, or it's kind of getting through the other fields of uh, our uh, social lives. Uh, this political political aspect of uh, of posture might appear uh, be part of the major trend of uh, the way how our post uh, modern thinking operates along with the mechanisms, along with the algorithms, and along with our <coughs> emotional setting. Uh, so, uh, to understand the logic of uh, this posture of social media, uh, we, uh, we, we needed to uh, attribute the values uh, which are dominating within the users. Uh, why was the values and why do we talk about this uh, in the very beginning? Uh, well, uh, recently, and not just recently, the Eagle Hearts Laboratory has been dealing with this for the past I don't know, decades of years, uh, we realized that the values are a great, um, not, not a factor, but it's like uh, uh, the, the, the great way to understand what's going on with the people in general throughout uh, the process of this dramatic change. So uh, we, we moved to the idea of values as quite essential for our research here. And the last question was, how does the medium itself produce and reproduces this logic? This is the algorithmic part of it. So, uh, as you have noticed, we got quite many research questions, and for this, we are uh, building a theoretical framework, which was actually a merge of uh, various concepts. So, uh, well, first of all, to understand what are the values, and how these values are reflected in the social media field and how they are reflected in the understanding of uh, individuals using the social media. We applied Schwartz uh, a scale of the survey for a values measurement. Uh, we also talk a lot of uh, the objectification here and uh, well, as, as you could see on the pictures, uh, there are elements of body, various uh, body parts and yeah, not here but on the previous slides. Uh, and the objectification appears to be one of the key uh, concepts here as we see uh, how through the uh, self-objectification of uh, the post-truth logic of social media is represented. 
And the overall framework uh, for the analysis and uh, for the um, for the conceptual definitions was uh, provided by the uh, symbolic interactionism framework. Uh, and to be specific, the concept of the social act, where we can define four stages, the impulse, uh, perception, manipulation, and uh, consummation, uh, to, <clears throat> to kind of deconstruct, I'm afraid to be a little bit too rude with the words, but to deconstruct the process of this uh, post-truth logic of social media imposing. So how does it work in our theoretical uh, uh, kind of thought experiment? So first we see the reaction to the simulation or the impulse as uh, the, uh, the Instagram use uh, pattern. So uh, it, I, I probably should have talked about it in the very beginning. We're focusing on the Instagram as the platform of social media uh, as it highlights the, uh, the most <laughs> interesting for this post-truth logic approach. Uh, it's very visual, it has words still, it has many different um, options for the interaction. So uh, we, we choose it uh, to see how the, uh, the, the consumption of the Instagram content, to be very simple, would be changing in the way how people attribute values to different uh, aspects of their lives. And we've chosen three, the most sensitive, which are health, beauty, and the third one is fitness. Uh, so, so the first stage, the individual is uh, being imposed to the Instagram. Basically, you as a user are subscribing and you're choosing the content you really want to follow. Then we're moving on to the perception stage when the object is formed in the mind. And we are thinking about this uh, step of uh, the interaction with the platform as uh, the active interaction. So we're talking about the way how people evaluate us, uh, putting likes, leaving the comments, and how do we evaluate others. So this is the moment when self-objectification happens. So what's going on? Basically, you have an Instagram account and you have various subscriptions where you see the examples of the way uh, you might want to be or something you really like. After that, you are having in the account the list of subscribers who approve or disapprove any kind of the social act of yours. And basically, when you make a post at some very beginning, you are getting through this experimental stage and you want to understand what your audience and it doesn't matter, is it going to be 1,000 people or is it going to be just 25 people and your mom? Uh, how this audience would be reacting on the pictures of yours. And basically here we need to follow the logic of our previous speaker. The self-censorship self, self happens, uh, but it goes for us uh, largely with the self-objectification. So you are adapting the content of your platform, of your user account, to the content which you see, and at the same time, you are losing the sense of self here as you are becoming the trading material for the likes and exchange of the comments. Uh, for us, this is a very crucial moment, and uh, we really wanted to focus on this one. So you're receiving the likes, and you start to uh, objectify yourself. And after that, your self, your self presentation strategy is changing to the self presentation strategy, not of yourself, but of your objectified self. And we also want to mention here that uh, these, after the certain point of the reflection, is driving the change in your values. As uh, you know, we are all human beings and we want to reason what we are doing, we want to reason all our actions. So we would have this shift in the values according to what we see on the Instagram, in our feed, in our subscriptions, and according with the way how we present our objectified self. And this, uh, this is how we were supposed to work in the theory. So what did we do? Now, what we're trying to do is to apply a mixed method research design, and we are almost done with this. Uh, so the first, we did a survey. And why did we do it? We wanted to depict four values, attributions to the categories of health, fitness, and beauty. This is where we applied the survey of So first, we identified the values people have, 
and then we asked them to talk about these three headquarters and we asked them to uh, attribute the values which they think would fit to these three concepts. And it was quite interesting, as I will show later on. After that, we conducted 20 in-depth interviews, if it's still uh, allowed to call them in-depth interviews. I think we could just call them interviews because they're supposed to be in-depth. So anyway, uh, we conducted 20 interviews to, uh, to get the, the data for this further deconstruction of the whole process, right? So we trace on the survey stage that the values attribution is quite weird. And now we wanted to understand why. So we recruited 20 participants from our survey, which was uh, generally uh, 18 to 25, 24, uh, and generally students of Moscow. So uh, we invited these people to, uh, to talk to them, by the way, how they uh, use uh, uh, Instagram and uh, what kind of health, fitness, and beauty content they consume. And what was mostly fascinating, uh, as we got to talk a lot about their uh, food disorders, uh, eating disorders, sorry. We, we talked about the eating disorders which appear to be a result, uh, after all, uh, uh, of the consumption of this content. And after that, uh, through the interviews, we uh, got the, the, the set of uh, the Instagram public pages related to the topics which were most often uh, outlined by our participants of the survey. Uh, and we did qualitative content analysis. Well, it would be too brave to say that we did and we finished with it, because uh, this is the, the point uh, where our research is, is looking for uh, prolonged directions. So, uh, what are our findings? Uh, I would might need some help from my colleagues here, as uh, through this survey, uh, we, I mean, in the interpretation, so uh, through the at the fighting stage, we want to outline the uh, the, the interesting uh, values attributions relating to the categories of health, beauty, and sports. So first of all, health is mostly associated among uh, our uh, our self-help, among our respondents with the concept of uh, enjoying the life and eco friendliness, which was quite weird as health uh, uh, associated with the uh, enjoyment and the way how beautiful life should be is not something that we think of when we talk about health. Uh, health would be related to the doctors, to the, uh, to the eating patterns and to the fruits and vegetables, which are boring. But how health becomes associated with the enjoyment, that's still quite a question. The second category, the category of beauty, was associated with creativity, accepting of my portion in life, so basically accepting yourself, and well, the, the world of beauty. The last one is quite obvious, uh, the creativity and the beauty is, uh, is interesting, so we might attribute it to this, um, uh, the, the whole trend of beauty bloggers, uh, the whole trend of the way how uh, the beauty industry is changing itself. So the beauty is not associated with the best in the humanity and the arts, but the creativity, which is a little bit different from the fine arts, I would say. Uh, well, sport, uh, for the sport, the main attributions for self-discipline, mm -hmm. health, uh, capabilities, I mean, uh, the capability to overcome the difficulties which are associated with the sport, and choosing all goals. So uh, when people were talking about, uh, when our respondents were, uh, talking about sport, they would focus on the uh, <coughs> how hard it is and how uh, the sport must uh, be seen as an achievement. The whole idea of the achievement and the uh, the, import, uh, the, the importance of uh, the achievement uh, as uh, the core value among uh, the recruited sample, and I think that's quite quite a trend in general, uh, is interesting, and it also requires further investigation. So after that, we talk to people, and what did we find out through this uh, through this interviews? First of all, uh, they do use a lot of Instagram. So forty-five hours a day. It's a long, a long time. That's like this really <laughs> is a lot. Well, I can I can say that these are the students, <coughs> and as I forbid to use the phones in my class, maybe. Uh, you know, they, they're not lucky enough to have uh, all their uh, teachers you know, forbidding posts. That would be very nice because I, I like restrictions. 
Anyway, so four to five hours a day, and uh, we focus on the micro influencers. Uh, what, what is that? So we have uh, uh, bloggers on the Instagram, the public pages, which have a lot, a huge number of followers, and we have micro influencers who have less number of followers but still are quite uh, famous in their communities. So uh, what we want to outline here is the search for the truth. Uh, why does it happen? So uh, people uh, in general understand the business of social media. So the trust decreases uh, to the uh, to the bloggers who have big audiences. Uh, they're quite many artifacts. It's about the commercial. It's about the way how they contradict themselves in their different posts and. Uh, Users will go to the bloggers with the smaller audiences, who are the micro influencers, in in a search for the truth. I think, which is very related to the topic of the conference. Uh, why do they do this? Why do they use Instagram? Well, first of all, they look, they use Instagram to observe. So, people not that interested in posting, which was secondary, rather than the observation. Uh, well, this is quite obvious. Before, there have people been reading in books, books to understand what's going on, reading newspapers. Now we have Instagram. Uh, but uh, the, the whole concept of uh, being exposed to this content for quite a long time and looking into lives of others might bring quite imbalanced effects as you are consuming a lot of information, but you're not converting this information into your own self-presentation, or uh, the second is the, the creativity. So people m watch more than posts. Also, they enjoy watching stories as they uh, look more sincere and more real for them. So uh, what we also understand there is that uh, the appearance and the lifestyle patterns are largely uh, picked up from the bloggers, especially among the young uh, audience. And uh, the, uh, the health disorders and the eating disorders themselves may conceptualize by our, uh, our respondents uh, uh, through the experience of uh, uh, Instagram uh, scanning. So they become kind of addicted to this I don't even understand. Uh, they become kind of addicted to uh, to the uh, to the accounts they subscribe to, and these accounts become a very uh, symbolic part of uh, their overall vision of, of of the way reality is created. Uh, okay, so uh, moving to the content analysis. <laughs> well, we just kind of got the chance to prove that self objectification. Uh, it's quite quite a big self-presentation strategy among the bloggers and among the public accounts. Uh, if you look at the left, uh, at the which is right for you, uh, how to green uh, is the store uh, of uh, food. So they they selling food, and as we've noticed previously on this slide, uh, the health is associated with the enjoyment of the life. We can see quite a clear proof right here. So uh, actually, as we, we are moving on with the with our analysis, uh, we trying and we are we are finding uh, the proof for the uh, social media post truth logic, and the, the general uh, objectification is quite obvious and one of uh, the uh, Instagram accounts of um, <coughs> the, the bloggers who are. Uh, who are leading this account through, uh, from their own name. So what we're planning to do as uh, we are planning to do the game, uh, we want to understand is it true or not, the way how values, uh, the values are changing through the interaction with the platform. And that would be the last stage of our analysis. And after that, we will be ready to, uh, to kind of use the, the experimental design, uh, experimental methods to understand and to prove that social media with the algorithms and with the value attribution does have its own logic and the manipulative power of this is quite huge. Thank you very much.